Good morning, and uh, welcome to the opening session of the molecular imaging track of the uh, World, uh, World Federation of Nuclear, Nuclear Medicine and Biology Congress. I'm Anna Wu from UCLA. I'm actually one of the track chairs along with Steve Meikle and uh, John Min, John Jun Min, and also Dong Su Lee, who helped uh, me and uh, really want to thank them for their efforts in putting together a truly international program for this molecular Im imaging track. We have three great introductory talks, uh, probably not even so introductory. I'm uh, hoping we'll also be hearing uh, the latest and most exciting uh, advances. Uh, and without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Sam Gambier. Uh, he's the chair of radiology at Stanford University. And uh, he really is a pioneer and a leader, uh, really one of the inventors of the field of molecular imaging, and has continued to push the limits and applications of this important um, approach. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Sam to the stage. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anna. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for inviting me to uh, be here in this wonderful country. Every time I come to Australia, I um, uh, wish I could live here and retire here. So one day, you never know. I just came from Tasmania uh, and found it to be a beautiful place as well. So, um, you know, I will um, give a brief overview within the time constraints we have. And I had assumed that many people would be somewhat familiar with molecular imaging, of course. But I will use uh, some examples that are perhaps not as much in the mainstream yet to illustrate some of the challenges we've had in taking concepts from um, the lab to clinical applications. And I think you'll get a sense of the similarities between that and then other areas in molecular imaging. So in terms of disclosures, um, they are as listed here. So we'll start with a background on molecular imaging strategies. Um, then I'm going to show you an interesting area that we've been working on for many years on ultrasound targeted microbubble molecular imaging. And this illustrates some of the interesting differences between uh, tracer-based strategies that most people in nuclear medicine are familiar with and what's happening in an entirely different domain. And then we'll talk a little bit about intraoperative optical fluorescence, although I know that will likely be covered a lot more by Vasilis next, and also on a different kind of optical imaging known as Raman imaging, which we'll talk about. And then I'll conclude. So the molecular imaging research chain continues to be very similar to the drug development strategies we're all familiar with. What I've been amazed by over the last uh, 15 years or so is how we've, as a society and as a group worldwide, accelerated our ability to go from molecular targets all the way to clinical imaging. In fact, if you back up, you know, decades ago, nuclear medicine quite often was not in the target discovery business. It took existing targets, existing drugs quite often, and would simply radio label one of many such drugs, and then move down this research chain. Over the last few years, the field has gotten better at identifying its own targets, because after all, our targets don't need to necessarily modulate the cell of interest, but only to detect the cell of interest. That biomarker discovery process is helping lead to many new targets to go after, some of which are still the same as pharma, but some are unique. Chemistry has also been accelerating to develop new imaging agents, whether they be small molecules or large molecules, or even, as we'll see, micro molecules, micro particles. And then the rest, in terms of testing in small animal models, cell culture, small animal imaging, and doing quantitative analysis, all continue to also expand as we get to more and more clinical imaging. We can now pretty much go from the beginning of this chain to clinical imaging within 18 months. It's unusual for us to bump into challenges other than with new classes of agents that I'll share. But otherwise, the, the, the whole field has done a terrific job coming together, really moving us through this pipeline relatively rapidly. And it's a far cry from the time when um, we were for example, building small animal imaging instruments where people were questioning, why are you guys building instruments that will image mice? Because in those days, people would really just image dogs and pigs. And 
the thought in the community was that by accelerating mouse models and the ability to study those, we would indeed accelerate clinical imaging. And I'm happy to see that that's exactly what's happened. There are many regional molecular imaging technologies that are evolving very rapidly. So whereas nuclear medicine has very much focused at all depths throughout the body and the ability to image the entire body, the regional imaging technologies are able to, in some ways, exceed what we can do in nuclear medicine, but only do it within a given region. We're seeing many developments in optical coherence tomography, for example, of the esophagus, photoacoustic imaging, in which light is used as an excitation and ultrasound as a emission detection, and we'll hear more about that from Vasilis. Optical endoscopy, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And even regional improvements in positron emission tomography where we're pushing the limits of resolution and sensitivity, leading to better ways to detect disease that we've been used to detecting at the whole body level. And finally, optical imaging, including of the breast, is accelerating as well as the area I'll share today most about, which is molecular ultrasound. How do we convert a modality like ultrasound to be much more molecular in nature to image uh, molecular targets of interest? But all these areas, again, doing exceptionally well thanks to the efforts of the entire community in multiple areas. On the imaging agent side, when I often talk to the public, I imagine a time where the red box shown here which we've been used to as being a radioactive atom, is in fact a generalizable red box. Sometimes it's an optical dye, sometimes a photoacoustic dye, sometimes it's a large particle that amplifies signal. Someday we'll probably have bidirectional communication. We think of the molecules as communicating to us only in a single direction, sending a signal, but in fact, in the nano domain, we're getting better and better at communicating also with the red box to tell the molecule to change state or to behave in different ways depending on where it is within the body. Nevertheless, the concept of what nuclear medicine originated with the tracer principle remains robust and intact. Can we take molecular specificity as provided by a given molecule and allow it to communicate with the external world through the physical spectrum uh, as shown here. Now, we're more used to the small molecule domain in nuclear medicine and certainly biologics like engineered proteins that Dr. Anna Wu will talk about uh, after Vasilis, but also expanding a lot in the last few years have been nanoparticles, such as the one shown here as just one example of many, in this case made out of gold shown in yellow and silica shown in blue, and the red layer shown in this molecule are actually small molecules that are going to be detectable that we'll talk about. And then on the very right, in the very large scale, are micro bubbles. These bubbles um, do not leave the vasculature and can only target vascular endothelial targets but have enormous capacity to produce a huge signal in an acoustic field. And we are taking advantage of that in several of the approaches we'll talk about. But throughout this entire size spectrum, molecular imaging continues to innovate with applications to new areas through new targets and new molecules. Now I'll use the microbubble arena just to illustrate some examples that hopefully are common to many of the areas we all work in. We started working with these many years ago. In my lab was a trainee who's now faculty at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Martin Rodriguez Porcel. And we thought at the time that microbubbles, which were already making their way into humans, could really become a very powerful molecular imaging technique if they could be targeted. Most of what had been done with microbubbles was not targeted. They would wander around the bloodstream and be used by our colleagues in radiology to look at contrast enhancement in vasculature. But we started working uh, at that time with uh, Dr. Jurgen Willman, who had just come to my labs at Stanford from Switzerland. Um, Jurgen um, pushed very hard to develop targeted microbubbles. 
And this particular microbubble you're looking at here is filled typically with a gas, in this case a perfluorobutane, and that gas will allow the bubble to contract and expand in an acoustic field under the right conditions. And the targeting in this case is shown by the ellipses on the surface of the bubble are ones that can be easily modified. In this case, the target was against vascular endothelial growth factor receptor type 2, which is in the human form known as KDR. And the targeting moiety here is actually a peptide. It's not an antibody on the surface of the bubble. It's actually a peptide. And that peptide ends up letting the bubble interact with KDR, which is present on vascular endothelium. So the bubble itself has many challenges because in the case of the US FDA, although the bubble was a well-known entity, even having made its way into humans, the targeting moieties were considered new. And the targeting moieties, when put on the surface of a bubble, led to a new entity that the FDA wanted significant toxicity testing on before it could go to humans. In working with BRACO uh, out of Switzerland and BRACO in Italy, we started a long process to move these bubbles through significant animal testing before we could, in fact, go to uh, clinical work. We chose KDR because VEGF receptor type 2 is expressed on neovasculature, on new vasculature of tumors, and is quite specific for that, other than in some areas of wound healing, such as, for example, premenopausal women uh, that may also have ovarian cancer. But otherwise, KDR can be a very good target that across multiple tumor types is present in new blood vessels feeding those tumors. In this case, the KD ended up being about 0.5 nanomolar, and the size of these bubbles ranged from around um, 1 to 3 microns, so they're quite large. That's why they won't leave the vasculature. And you can have many targeting peptides on their surface, in this case, around 36,000 per micrometer squared. So these particular approaches um, then, which I won't, for time's sake, get into, led to a lot of different animal studies. But the concept is very similar to what we're used to in nuclear medicine. You have, in this case, a bubble. In the preclinical versions of these, we would have streptavid and biotin as a linker and even antibodies, but that's not the version that would be clinically taken forward. But the key is these microbubbles then, when injected into the vasculature, end up circulating through the vasculature. They also are taken up by the reticuloendothelial system. We have detailed studies where we radioactively label the bubbles also. And all those shown here is just one antibody on the surface of the bubble. Of course, there's thousands of them. And this bubble then locks on to and binds to a vascular endothelial target, in this case, KDR or VEGF receptor type 2. The beauty of this is now when you come in with ultrasound waves, you have now the ability to detect where the bubbles are. Literally, you yell at the bubbles, and the bubbles yell back at you. And that allows you to detect them. It also allows you to destroy the imaging agent if you choose to do so, and then allow for recirculation to occur to allow the bubbles to rebind to target, which opens up very interesting kinetic modeling processes for mapping quantitatively the number of receptors on the vascular surface. So this particular approach was studied in quite a bit of detail and continues to be um, pancreatic adenocarcinoma in spontaneous tumor models and transgenic tumor models, breast cancer models, uh, models that also don't involve cancer at all but involve inflammatory conditions uh, and dysplastic conditions can also be looked at. And of course, like we're used to in nuclear medicine, you can look at the response to therapy by simply re-injecting the bubbles over and over. So all these studies helped us validate in animal models that these were likely going to have significant potential in humans. In fact, in animals, we now image down to around 0.7 millimeters of a tumor and have exquisite sensitivity at any point within the animal other than areas such as the lungs where, of course, sound waves do poorly uh, 
And that's why, of course, ultrasound is not used in lung imaging. Other than that, and near bone, where you can have issues with ultrasound, this is an exquisitely sensitive technique that can detect very few bubbles and therefore very small areas of tumors. So we move these eventually into humans. Um, that process, as I mentioned, with the FDA was interesting. Uh, we had to work a lot to show what happens exactly to the gas within the bubbles. It's exhaled out. We had to show um, what happens to the targeting molecules on the surface of the bubble. We had to show a lot of work around potentials for cardiotoxicity. There had been some events in bubbles given to humans that were not targeted, in which there was hypotensive episodes in a few uh, subjects, and so all those raised concerns. And we worked through that with BRACO in this case, and eventually were able to take uh, the bubbles to humans uh, in 2016. That process took about five years in this case because of some of the subtleties to this class of agent. But now with new bubbles, we think we can do it within a year and a half to two years. This is one example of a patient in which you're looking at the traditional ultrasound image on the left in panel A. And in panel B, you're looking at 15 minutes after an intravenous injection of targeted microbubbles and you're seeing homing of these bubbles to what ends up being vasculature feeding a serous cyst adenocarcinoma. And then C and D are just staining for blood vessels by CD31 and the presence of the target of the bubbles, KDR, uh, to show that in fact histology matches with what we're finding when the bubbles home to this site. The good news for us in doing these was that there was very little uh, difficulty once the bubbles were actually FDA approved and rapidly the number of subjects start to accumulate and are still accumulating. Here's a second example of an individual with a Brenner tumor, which is a benign tumor, and now again the ultrasound in panel A. In panel B, you don't see bubbles homing to this particular benign tumor because there is very little KDR expression and panel C, D, and E are just uh, the pathology confirmations of what we're seeing. It's taken us a while to read these. You think nuclear medicine images are hard to read, ultrasound images are <laughs> even harder, um, but uh, Jurgen and I spent a lot of time uh, reading these over uh, several years to try to make sense of things. Actually, what helps you a lot in ultrasound in this case is the arrival of the bubbles and then the clearance of the bubbles when they haven't bound. So the videos are very helpful to understanding the homing of the bubbles uh, to a given target site. Here's just another example now shifting to ductal adenocarcinoma. Again, you see the beauty of a lesion that would be very hard to be conclusive about on ultrasound alone without targeted microbubbles in panel A. And then as soon as you give the targeted microbubbles, and in this case, wait 13 minutes, you can see nicely the accumulation of bubbles into that ductal adenocarcinoma that's expressing a significant amount of KDR in its neovasculature. So this then led to many more patients, and I won't take you through them all, but just to show you that, again, when you have a benign lesion, as in this case a fibroadenoma, the lack of bubble binding. And so this particular paper, which just came out a few months ago, which really represents about a seven-year journey, is showing us with even the first target, which is KDR, and one of many that could be chosen, a relatively good performance of lesions that range from about five millimeters up to a few centimeters. We have not yet started to look carefully at lesions in the one to five millimeter. I do not expect the bubbles will do that well in lesions below one millimeter, because you don't have, in such small lesions for the most part, neovasculature that will have KDR. So since these, these bubbles are restricted to the blood vessel, that being a significant negative of them, you cannot go after a target, let's say, on the cancer cell surface. So that will limit maybe their applications to very, very small lesions. But nevertheless, as you can see here, in matching between blinded reads of pathologists and uh, two of us, Jurgen and myself, on the imaging side, you can see the kind of uh, findings we were getting in ovarian and, in this case, breast lesions.
This has now rapidly expanded. There are multiple NIH-funded trials in ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer. We are getting ready to expand these internationally, and we expect that there will be some good learning uh, points of the limitations of this particular class of imaging agent shortly. Um, <clears throat> so in summary for this class of agent, good safety profile. We did not um, see any significant adverse offense. Unlike PET tracers, these are given at higher mass level. Uh, in this case, 0.08 milliliters per kilogram body weight. Um, they target, as I mentioned, is KDR, and what we've shown is that's technically feasible for the first time in humans using clinically available ultrasound equipment. One of the beauties of these approaches is because ultrasound is ubiquitous throughout the world, and the shelf life of these bubbles is at least one plus years, you can have doses waiting ready to administer and ready to go after multiple applications. The imaging signal can be visualized over a substantial period of time, 6 to 29 minutes, depending on the administered dose. And the targeted ultrasound imaging allows visualization of KDR, as I showed you, with good matching between imaging and immunohistochemistry. And therefore, now we are moving towards more and more patient subjects with this class of imaging agents. To show you how this might compete with nuclear medicine, we're hearing all the excitement, for example, in PSMA and bombasin receptor imaging uh, with PET, you can imagine a time when through transrectal ultrasound, which is what's traditionally done by urologists, that you not only are imaging um, <clears throat> from the PET side, where you will get, of course, much more staging-based information, but also on the prostate side, looking directly to improve biopsy guidance, and also in surveillance, when you do active surveillance of potential high-risk prostate cancer patients or those that already have prostate cancer but are being monitored, you may be able to then monitor them using these bubble-based approaches. So we're hopeful that is, in fact, what will occur with this class of agent. Now, we're also solving multiple other issues that relate to the limitations of these bubbles. These bubbles are, in fact, uh, not able to get out of the vasculature. So if you build nanobubbles, the nanobubbles can leave the vasculature, but each nanobubble, because it has much lower volume of gas, will not produce a significant signal. So what you really need are nanobubbles that can leave the vasculature, but then reassemble into larger micro-shaped bubbles. And that's one of the approaches we've been using. So for example, if you imagine a tumor being fed by vasculature here, and you give one kind of nanobubble that leaves the vasculature, if you used ultrasound, you wouldn't detect this signal. It's not significant because the nanobubbles are too small by themselves. You give a second kind of bubble, and the second bubble also goes into the tumor bed. But then, based on an enzyme or other interaction, in this case a metalloprotease interaction, you can then get the two bubble types to aggregate, forming a larger bubble structure. And this approach, along with several other related approaches, are things that we're working on now that you'll start to see from us uh, in meetings where we've been able to get nanobubbles working to produce not only a high signal, but then target things outside the vasculature, for example, PSMA and bombasin receptor to marry with transrectal ultrasound. So we're very excited about this whole class of agents, and I think it serves a lot of lessons about what it takes to get from a new class of agent all the way through the FDA to clinical applications that hopefully will lead to better patient care in the years to come. Now on the optical side, I wanted to just highlight briefly uh, two examples to show how this area is also moving very quickly. Um, there are many antibodies that are being labeled with optical dyes optical dyes that are in the near-infrared and also in the near-infrared 2 window now. But the key is that these antibodies, already clinically approved, can be accelerated through the FDA pipeline because the drug component of the drug, in this case without the label, has already been approved. So in this case, with cetuximab and IR dye 800, one can in fact inject these fluorescent antibodies right before you even take a patient into the clinic. And then as you'll see in the next slide, look at the same patient later in the process in the operating room and in the histological setting. 
So even Rosenthal, who's a head and neck surgeon at Stanford, has been pioneering approaches of these optical fluorescent antibodies. He is in the clinic looking at his patients as you're seeing here, and then moving into the operating room to optimize surgery in this case, guided through a fluorescent antibody. And then the actual post-resection sample can be imaged um, as shown here, and then surgical pathology can also be done. So I think there's a huge explosion of these approaches, multiple new antibodies that are being approved or in the process of being approved, and then ones like this that are already being used, not just in head and neck, but in several cancer types. I also wanted to mention that for several years, um, my own lab had been pursuing Raman molecular imaging. I presented this for the first time maybe a decade ago, not thinking it would take this long. This is one of the most sensitive approaches we have seen to date. We are now approaching atomolar sensitivity, which we've never seen with any imaging. The idea here is that instead of measuring fluorescence, you're measuring inelastic light scatter. So you're still exciting with light waves, but you're measuring the inelastically scattered photons. You have, though, at the expense, not the ability to do that with enough signal with single small molecules, but you need to enhance the surface plasma on resonance, which is done with the gold that's in this gold silica particle that's shown on the bottom. This approach, although initially tested in mice, is now also being rapidly clinically translated. And we're also looking at approaches here where one could do surgical planning, deep tumor localization in the operating room, and then fine margin resection. Here's an MRI pre and post injection of these agents. The agents in this case have also been modified with gadolinium, so they're visible in MRI. Then with photoacoustic imaging, which we'll hear more about in the next talk, one has a signal before you inject the particles from blood vasculature absorbing the signal, uh, absorbing light, and then post-delivery of the particles, you see more uh, signal. And then Raman comes in and lets us do very fine, exquisite sampling of the tumor bed letting us pick out even individual cells because of the exquisite sensitivity of the approach. So these multimodality approaches, we believe, will also uh, be very useful. To end just in the last couple of minutes, there is a huge explosion of optical techniques, including in areas where you can get close to the signal, like in endoscopy. And Raman is no exception. We have designed multiple Raman instruments that are now moved into humans. In this case, the instruments can be threaded through a traditional endoscope, and then that instrument, in this case, provides light that is going to excite Raman particles that are either topically applied or intravenously administered and home to site. And then, just like a lighthouse beacon might scan uh, the environment, these endoscope systems scan the bowel. And that leads to the ability to detect lesions that are otherwise entirely missed because they're, for example, entirely flat. And that's what you see here in a human bowel with the ability to scan that entire human bowel circumferentially. The spectral signature of these uh, is also quite unique. So you can embed multiple small molecules in the red layer that you're seeing and pick up multiple kinds of nanoparticles that are targeted to different entities on the, the cancer uh, surface uh, side. So these approaches that I've tried to highlight are all just examples of how I think the tracer principle is gonna continue to grow. For those people that have always wondered why these are taking longer, of course, just like PET tracers took a while to accelerate and are now much quicker to get through the FDA, we're gonna see the same, whether it's an ultrasound, as I showed, or optical imaging agents many different areas that are really rapidly extending. And so in conclusion, fundamentals of the nuclear medicine tracer principle are being rapidly extended to other modalities, such as ultrasound, optical fluorescence, and optical Raman imaging. Targeted microbubble ultrasound imaging has recently been extended to first in human studies and has been shown to be safe and is being studied in several clinical applications, multiple trials that will now go multi-center and international are in progress. Fluorescence optical imaging is rapidly expanding in clinical intraoperative applications. I showed one example of the EGFR fluorescent antibody. And then Raman optical imaging, which offers exquisite sensitivity, is also 
getting rapidly translated to clinical applications, especially in endoscopic applications. I want to thank the over 200 or so scientists in the molecular imaging program at Stanford. We are rapidly uh, growing multiple areas, and it's a real privilege to work with engineers, physicists, clinicians, computational scientists that are helping to make all of these approaches possible. And I want to do a special shout out to Dr. Jurgen Willman. He worked very hard on the microbubble projects I showed you. Unfortunately, Jurgen died in a car accident on January 8th of this year. He was sent to my lab from the Swiss National Foundation and is a perfect example of how global uh, work in moving students and trainees between labs around the world leads to real innovative work that hopefully helps humanity throughout the world. But a real special thanks to Jurgen for all his hard efforts over the years. And finally, reminder to all of you that are interested in molecular imaging, in Seattle this year will be the 2018 WMIC and there's still time for late-breaking abstracts, which are June 6th through 20th. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam, uh, really uh, opening our eyes to new windows where we can uh, explore important biology in patients. Uh, and also remind you all that Sam will be doing a plenary talk also towards the end of this Congress, I think on Tuesday morning, where he will also provide a, a, an additional perspective on the field of molecular imaging. Okay, I will be giving the final talk of this session, and we're going to change gears somewhat to focusing on uh, imaging immune responses. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think actually, Imaging immunology, inflammation, and immune responses is really uh, an ideal field to now turn the power of nuclear medicine imaging to for a number of reasons. Uh, one being that the immune system is a system, so this is an area where we need to have whole body imaging. Uh, I think also the sensitivity of the radioactive detection methods uh, are going to be critical, again, for uh, assessing what's going on in the entire body. And importantly, in terms of molecular imaging, this is where we're going to need highly specific probes uh, that uh, we can then employ in conjunction with, for example, pets, pet uh, imaging and other radioactive methodologies in order to really survey what's happening in the immune system. So these are, let's, okay, these are my disclosures. And um, I do want to say that I'm going to focus primarily in oncology, and in particular, I'm going to use immuno-oncology for most of my examples, uh, primarily because this is an area that's seen dramatic uh, advances in terms of what's uh, been happening in the therapeutics field, but also a field that still uh, leaves many challenges. So this is just to remind you about the complex conversation that, help, that takes place in the body between tumors and the patient's immune system. And generally, tumors get away with what they're doing because they've induced immunosuppressive uh, activity. And the immune system no longer recognizes those tumors as, um, un as uh, damaged or unnatural or malignant cells. And so therapists, immunologists, have tried to understand the complex interactions between all these kinds of cells. And then people developing immunotherapies then have, have been, of course, looking at ways to intervene and try to reactivate patients' immune systems. For example, through immunization to get better expression or exposure of tumor-specific antigens, uh, and then ways to in increase and improve the interaction of uh, the cells that the antigen-presenting cells that take up those antigens, such as dendritic cells, and then present them to immune cells, such as T cells uh, in the uh, regional lymph nodes in order to re-educate and uh, activate and expand those T cells, especially the cytotoxic T cells, uh, plus the ancillary uh, helper cells that go with them, to go back to the tumor and then kill them in very specific fashions. And uh, this is a very, very active field. It has been for a long time, but for example, the uh, drugs in development as well as approved products include uh, tumor vaccines, uh, include... Um, cytokines, et cetera, that will stimulate uh, the uh, antigen presentation and the activation process, checkpoint inhibitors that will start to release those breaks on immune responses that that tumor, that are actually, some of them are the natural product of immune responses where, because immune responses are self-limiting and T cells will naturally become exhausted, uh, but tumors will also find ways to uh, uh, deliberately put uh, immune cells into a more uh, quiescent state. And then more direct methods of bispecific agents that will recruit cytotoxic T cells directly to tumors. Uh, and uh, finally, a lot of excitement and actually now two approved products in the US based on cell-based 
therapies using chimeric antigen receptors to redirect T cells so that they um, are genetically engineered uh, from the patient's own T cells, and they can directly go in and recognize tumor cells without needing to go through this whole endogenous process of, of, of immunization. So this is the, the setting in which we now are looking at um, are there um, tools that we can provide through nuclear medicine to help understand this process and, and uh, develop it better. And I want to show you just an example of one of the problems that, that um, has been faced. So first of all, the promise of checkpoint inhibitor therapy. This is a slide from Tony Rebus at UCLA. He's a melanoma immunotherapist who led a lot of the um, early studies on checkpoint inhibitors. And uh, in patients uh, treated, melanoma patients treated with anti-CTLA-4, this is just one example of the very dramatic responses that you can see. These are FDG PET scans uh, following checkpoint inhibitor therapy. But on the right is shown one of the challenges that was faced in approximately uh, maybe about 10% of patients that were treated with a single uh, ipilimumab anti-CTLA-4 antibody. You sometimes see this phenomenon called pseudoprogression where you begin treating the patient, and then when you bring them back at three months for that CT or MRI to see how they're doing, the tumors are larger, and they're still hot by FDG PET. So by formal resist criteria, these would be progressions. But if you keep treating the patients, what you find is over time, uh, those tumors, uh, by later on, week 24 or a year later, those tumors can finally regress, and these patients will get durable responses. Likewise, in this lower set of uh, images from a patient with a, a renal mass as well as a lung mass, at week 12, you see no change or larger tumors, and it takes, you know, three months, six months, sometimes a year before you see a durable response. So this phenomenon of, of pseudoprogression uh, is vexing to clinicians as well as people uh, you know, trying to uh, develop new uh, therapies. So that's one of, of a number of challenges. Uh, and again, bearing in mind that we need to look at the whole patient and the whole immune system. Uh, the ability to distinguish between true responses versus non-responders. Uh, delayed responses and pseudoprogression to understand you know, which of those patients will eventually um, be responding. A fundamental issue uh, that, again, whole body imaging can address is heterogeneity of tumor biology and of immune responses. Within the same patient from lesion to lesion, the biology can be very different, and immune res responses to immunotherapy can be varied across different lesions. We have metabolic imaging, uh, FDG PET, of course, a mainstay of, of um, oncology imaging, but a challenge is that immune activation also involves similar metabolic shifts, overlapping metabolic shifts. So you can't tell whether the FDG signal you're seeing from a lesion is due to the tumor continuing to progress or an active immune response in that lesion. And we have biopsies. Uh, there are actually some uh, really informative work being uh, undertaken, especially with a serial biops biopsies in patients with tre undergoing treatment. And they can provide tremendously detailed uh, and complex information in terms of the kinds of uh, genomics, you know, omics profiling that can be done, or T cell receptor uh, repertoire uh, cloning to look at uh, diversity versus clonality of immune responses, all invaluable information. but. One of the challenges, of course, is when you do biopsies in patients that are undergoing treatment, you have sampling limitations. These are typically just needle biopsies at that point. Uh, and it's an invasive process. It's not usually done after initial diagnosis. It's more, taken, more undertaken in a research setting. It's not really something we can implement routinely. These uh, targeted biopsies are expensive, uh, and they're not without um, morbidities, depending on where those lesions might be. So those are some challenges. And then if we take a step back and look at it, the broader questions that cancer immunotherapists are trying to ask, one challenge is that there are real but modest response rates. And uh, so once you venture beyond melanoma and the combination therapies of melanoma where you can get response rates of 50% or higher and move into some more challenging solid tumors that are, for example, have a lower mutation burden, you might get 10% or 15% of patients uh, responding. And to be able to understand which patients are more likely to respond, which ones are responding, because these are um, time consuming and uh, expensive and um, treatments that are not always effective. And we should not also forget that they also uh, induce, in some cases, very severe toxicities. The immune system can sometimes overshoot uh, under stimulation, and so we see many autoimmune type side effects. We see things such as pleuritis, colitis, even type 1 diabetes uh, coming up in patients under these uh, immunotherapies. And so, um, 
and again, one more uh, element, which there's both promise as well as challenge, is the fact that people developing these therapies realize that it's not going to be one size fits all. These therapies are going to work best in combination with other immunotherapies or with other modalities, such as combining radiation therapy with checkpoint inhibitors or uh, chemotherapy inducing immunogenic cell death followed by a cocktail of checkpoint inhibitors. So we need to be able to develop rash, um, combination therapies and hopefully in a rational uh, process. Right now, it's very much empirical in terms of trying to understand and determine uh, how to combine different therapies. So that's the landscape um, of the challenges faced. And so our question is, how can molecular imaging used to be used to assess immune responses? So in the rest, the bulk of this talk, I actually want to do two Two things. One is to kind of give you a snapshot of what's going on in the field of molecular imaging of immune responses with a focus on the immune cells, and then also to give you um, more detailed examples of, what, of work that we're doing. But I thought that it would be important in this setting to give you uh, not just our work, but what other uh, groups have also been doing, because it is a very, very active field. So first of all, this is a snapshot. Uh, if we just focus on imaging the immune cells themselves, which is what I am going to be talking about primarily, this is sort of a snapshot of the general approaches that people have taken in the molecular imaging field. I've already mentioned uh, imaging altered metabolism, for example, using fluorodeoxyglucose or fluorothymidine for proliferation, or more recently, people have been able to take advantage of the fact that activated immune cells uh, will often upregulate their nucleoti nucleoside salvage pathways. And so there are nucleoside analogs, such as clofarabine or ERA-G, labeled with fluorine 18, that can also be used to visualize that immune cell activation. They can be complicated, however, by the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, some of these metabolic shifts offer, often overlap with what's, what the tumor cells will do as well. So they may be useful for imaging you know, the uh, immune, immune or the lymphoid organs, but it may or may not be as useful to try to understand what's happening to those uh, infiltrating lymphocytes or uh, immune cells in the tumor. Uh, there's also a long history in nuclear medicine of ex vivo labeling of cells and putting them back into patients. For decades, we have been taking patients' white blood cells, labeling them with indium oxine, infusing them back into the patient to understand where infection might be taking place. And so that field has also advanced, uh, been upgraded, as it were, for example, by the use of zirconium oxine, uh, so that we can take advantage of PET instead of uh, gamma gamma imaging or SPECT. And then a variety of nanoparticles are now being used to label cells and cell subsets ex vivo and infuse them back into either our preclinical models or potentially into patients to be able to follow them. We can also engineer cells genetically so that they have reporter genes that will produce something that, again, that we can detect um, um, in vivo using either radioactive methods, such as PET imaging or optical or SPECT. And so that is another field, for example, people are using in the clinic things such as um, SSTR2, because we have a clinical agent, NetSpot, that we can use to image. Uh, or the EGFR uh, truncated version, that not only gives you a target for imaging using uh, EGFR-specific antibodies, but also a way to ablate any cells that you introduce, because you can use uh, the anti-EGFR antibodies to uh, eliminate those uh, cells in case uh, you have um, an overshoot of the, what you want to, where you want to be therapeutically. HSVTK, reporter genes that, that um, tra trap uh, novel, you know, in, uh, exogenous radio-labeled nucleosides can also be used in a reporter setting. And finally, what we and many other people have been doing is to directly image those endogenous markers uh, using antibodies or their derivatives, such as nanobodies or other small protein scaffolds. So what I'd like to do in the next few slides is just give you um, a few quick examples of the first three and then talk a little more about ImmunoPet. So first of all, I will say that FDG-PET is not dead. Um, it, is, it can be a challenge, as, as those of you who are oncologists know. Uh, the major reason we see false positives in our PET scans in oncology patients can be due to infection or inflammation. Well, those are actually true positives because it's a true uh, increase in glycolytic signal that's giving you that, um, that image, but it's not exactly what we were looking for. So what people are finding is that instead of looking at three months, it may be useful to look earlier. And this is work out of uh, Steve Cho, uh, originally at Johns Hopkins, he's now moved. But um, looking at, instead of at three months, looking at an earlier FDG PET <clears throat> scan, either at three to four weeks after treatment begins 
or also a more conventional three or four months later. And what they found in this study was that that earlier assessment at three to four weeks was actually much more predictive of the ultimate response as opposed to looking later. So the, the, the concept being that once you begin these immunotherapies, there's an initial surge of uh, immune response and proliferation that you could pick up. And in fact, many groups in the field are now looking even earlier at seven days after treatment initiates or perhaps even earlier. So that's where I think we're looking at that early FDG PET flare could be very, very useful. Okay, second class, ex vivo label labeling. So this is uh, just an example from uh, the NCI from Noriko Sato and Peter Choiki, uh, where they took, uh, instead of indium-111 oxine, have been working diligently on adapting zirconium-89 oxine for cell labeling. Uh, they've optimized the labeling for a variety of immune cells, dendritic cells, naive and activated CD8 T cells. Uh, they looked very rigorously at, at vi viability and functionality of these cells after labeling, so they would not uh, overdo because, as you know, immune cells are um, radiosensitive. Uh, too much radioactivity will kill them. A little bit of re radioactivity can activate them. And what's interesting here, this is just showing uh, dendritic cells versus na naive uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes, and you can see that they both pass through the lung initially, but the dendritic cells take up um, residence in the spleen and liver, whereas these naive uh, CTL home to spleen and lymph nodes instead. So you can see differential homing of these subcell, these uh, cell uh, subsets. And they've moved on to NHP work, and I, and I think a number of groups are using this approach. This is just one example, but the idea is to be able to use this in patients. And a third example, which is in patients, uh, is a major group effort from a number of groups, including Stanford, UCLA, City of Hope, you can see all the authors here, um, where this uh, concept of doing a reporter gene, uh, the HSVTK, in combination with fluorine 18 labeled reporter probe, FHBG, and what they've done is they've introduced this reporter gene into uh, T cells that have been genetically modified to express this IL-13 zetakine, uh, GBMs express IL-13 receptors, so this, the uh, targeting molecule is actually the IL-13 uh, cytokine itself fused to the zetakine intracellular signaling molecule. And what they've done here is looked pre-infusion uh, of these um, genetically modified cytotoxic lymphocytes versus, uh, let's see, I don't remember, oh, um, I don't remember exactly, maybe how many days, uh, one week after administration, intratumoral injection of these, these uh, genetically modified T cells. And what you can see is this very dramatic increase of the reporter gene signal showing that those cells are in the, uh, still in the tumor region and have been proliferating. So, uh, and then moving on now to what will be the crux of uh, my discussion, uh, use it, looking at immunopet. And the reason we want to use uh, immunopet, which is the combination of using antibodies, the specificity of antibodies with PET, uh, is to be able to take advantage of you know, putting together that specificity with the resolution and quantitation that's available. Uh, and um, this will allow us to directly image cell surface markers. And uh, many of the shortcomings of antibodies have been uh, overcome through protein engineering, including reduction of immunogenicity through humanization, Optimization of pharmacokinetics, that's what my lab has focused on, is to uh, accelerate the pharmacokinetics and also to make these antibody-based molecules biologically inert. We don't, uh, these are not supposed to be administered with therapeutic intent. We don't want to tweak or kill or activate the immune cells. We just want the antibody uh, combining site to be used as a vehicle for delivery, very targeted delivery of our uh, radionuclides. And the other thing that's helped, of course, has been the much uh, broader availability of positron emitting radionuclides with longer physical half lives, such as copper 64, zirconium 89, and I 124. So um, I will just go through this quickly, but my lab has focused on engineered antibody fragments such as mini bodies and diabodies that are derived from intact antibodies, but they're smaller. And as a result, they target very well, but they also do it with kinetics that are much more rapid than no native intact antibodies will take. For example, uh, here are a cognate set of uh, fragments that recognize PSCA, prostate stem cell antigen, and you can see high contrast images, but the key point is that in order to get this image with an intact antibody, we had to wait a week, whereas with a minibody or diabody, similar contrast and clearance of the background can be attained either the next day or even the same day using these very small engineered antibody fragments. <clears throat> and so what about immune cells? Well, if you remember your uh, hematopoietic lineages here, this is just the lymphoid arm. Uh, there's also the myeloid and the other <clears throat> blood components. You'll remember that there are a wonderful set of markers that define these lineages. So we have the T cells, the B cells, the NK cells, and even within the T cells, we have CD4, 
positive, we have CD8 positive T, T cells. They're all very well defined in terms of their lineage, differentiation, activation, and function by these CD cell surface markers. And if we could directly image using those markers, this would be very useful both looking at immune responses and inflammation, but also cancer immunotherapy. And I'll remind you that many of the immunotherapies that people are using converge on the CD8 positive cytotoxic T cell as the actual drug. It's not the checkpoint inhibitor antibody that's the drug. It's the T cell itself that does the actual killing of, of the uh, tumor cells. So, and we're also guided by what's been done by the clinicians um, uh, who have used biopsies as ways to monitor uh, immune responses. Uh, for example, out of uh, Tony Rebus's lab at UCLA and also from the uh, group at MD Anderson, um, people have looked at early on treatment biopsies of patients starting checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And what they found is that there's a high correlation between um, the appearance of high numbers of CD8 cytotoxic T cells in your tumor with an ultimate uh, response to the therapy. So here's pretreatment, after treatment, and showing the correlation that the higher the change and the increase in the CD8 T cell density, the more robust response uh, to the agent you ultimately get. So, and likewise down here, looking at pretreatment biopsy and early on treatment biopsies, usually you know, three to six weeks after initiating treatment, the most characteristic signal that they saw of the patients that ultimately responded was an increase of the CD8 T cell infiltration. And so the question is, can you directly image CD8 T cells in vivo? Um, and the answer is yes. This is something my lab has been working on in mice for quite some time. Uh, so this is our workhorse imaging agent in the preclinical setting, which is a smaller fragment called a cyst diabody, labeled with zirconium 89. If you look at a normal mouse, you can see that this protein clears to the kidneys. That's just the normal nonspecific <clears throat> route of clearance. But you can also see the spleen, and a very nice map of the lymph nodes, the normal lymph nodes in this normal mouse. And we started applying this to some models, including, first of all here, a hematopoietic stem cell transplantation model uh, in mice. And what you can see is after you irradiate and then reinfuse donor uh, stem cells over the period of two, four, and eight weeks, you can see uh, the lymph nodes starting to reappear, the spleen starting to reappear as those CD8 positive T cells reconstitute their populations in the mouse. And here is the, then the key experiment. Can we see those CD8 T cells in models of tumor immunotherapy? And the answer is yes. Uh, this is a syngeneic uh, mouse model where the, the CT26 tumors uh, in the mice were treated with anti-CD137 antibody. It's a general immunostimulatory antibody. If you do this uh, protocol, at about day 20, those tumors will disappear. But if we look at day 15, what you will see if you take the tumors out and stain them for the CD8 cytotoxic T cells is that massive infiltration in the mice that are treated. And what happens if we image the mouse in vivo on the right? First of all, it control untreated mouse. Here's the uh, clearance to the kidney, which <clears throat> is normal. You'll also see uh, an outline of the spleen, and you can see this large, diffuse tumor. And if you look at the actual sections, you can see the center of the tumor is cold. And here's the treated mouse. Uh, so first of all, you'll notice the tumor is smaller. Uh, it is hotter and much more uniformly involved through and through with T cells, as you can see in, we have a series of act, the actual sections. But you'll also see the systemic effects. And this is why, again, having whole body nuclear medicine uh, approaches is so important because we can see the entire immune system is activated. The spleen is much larger. It's densely involved with CD8 T cells, and all of the lymph nodes in the mouse are lar larger and hotter, including, in particular, the ipsilateral draining lymph nodes. At the right, far right panel is, is just a uh, blocking control to show that all of that signal that we see here is specific. And um, so that's the story with CD8 imaging, and we also want to look at other immune subsets. So just quickly, uh, we've also been imaging CD4, which includes the helper subsets as well as the regulatory subsets, but still a very interesting uh, set of, of uh, immune cells to look at. Uh, again, a cyst diabody labeled zirconium 89. Here is the uh, normal mouse. Again, there's clearance to the kidney, but you can see spleen in a map of the lymph nodes. And similarly, in that stem cell transplantation model, you can see the, the um, lymph nodes filling in and the spleen filling in over the period of, of eight weeks. But now we're looking at the CD4 component, not the CD8 component. And that, again, is the beauty of using antibodies as your targeting agent. And this is where we really diverged uh, out of oncology and into inflammatory bowel disease uh, in a model of colitis, uh, DSS-induced colitis in mice. Um, we wanted to look at inflammatory and autoimmune responses. If you put uh, DSS in the drinking water of these mice for five days, uh, then they, uh, by day 12, will develop colitis, which is uh, 
marked by a, a massive infiltration of CD4 T cells into the colon of the mouse. And that's shown here in these pet images. Here's the normal mouse, uh, colon is cold. Uh, and here is the colitic mouse. I'm sorry, these uh, labels got shifted over, but you can see uh, large, uh, meson enlarged mesenteric lymph nodes much more prominently, and now you see directly in the colon, signal directly in the colon, uh, more visible here on the side view, the sagittal view, because we have contrast in the colon. In the normal mouse, you can see the colon is cold. In the uh, colitic mouse, it's hot. And if we remove those tissues and re-image them ex vivo, it's very clear the difference between the control uh, cecum and colon and mesenteric lymph nodes versus the colitic ones. And we've, we've confirmed the presence of the CD8 T, T cells in those diseased mice by uh, flow cytometry and immunohistochemistry. So um, in the next few minutes, I'd actually like to focus on what's going on in the field and call your attention to some key questions that can now be addressed using these types of immunopet approaches. So for example, can immunotherapy targets be imaged? And can imaging predict response to therapy? So as you can imagine, because uh, you know, the initial, uh, in addition to the CTLA-4 antibodies, uh, antibodies targeting PD-1 and the PDL one checkpoint inhibitor axis have shown great success in, in a subset of, uh, on, of malignancies. And so many groups have focused on, can we directly image PD-1, PD-L1 in, um, and these are some examples in preclinical models where people have used uh, intact uh, PDL1 specific antibodies labeled with indium or some more novel uh, platforms, including soluble PD-1 itself uh, as the basis of a probe for imaging PDL1. Um, and then here at the bottom, we have a couple of groups that have demonstrated the ability to use some of these smaller protein scaffolds, such as alphabodies or adnectins, uh, to, instead of antibodies, to uh, develop uh, immunopet agents for imaging uh, PD-1 or PDL1. And just wanted to show you a couple of examples of that. So here, for example, is um, from uh, Stanford, is a uh, copper 64 labeled uh, therapeutic drug, pembrolizumab, uh, in mice, uh, showing that here is a control NSG mouse. Here is a humanized uh, NSG mouse, uh, uh, with a, with, um, which is not blocked. And here is the mouse that is blocked to show you that there is specific targeting and imaging of the, um, the uh, PDL. PDL1 in these mice in this model. And here is the example of the uh, adnectin. Uh, this is now labeled with fluorine 18 by click chemistry. And similarly, you can see in a high PD1 versus a low PD1 expressing tumor, you can see differential uptake of that uh, tracer, uh, confirming the ability to image these markers in vivo. How about this next question? And this is one that we're all very interested in. Can early imaging of T cell infiltration predict ultimate response, because that's the question we're asking with the pseudoprogression. So a couple of groups have looked at this. Uh, for example, uh, for Umar Mahmoud's group at Mass General, or Rashidian and uh, Hedy Plug at uh, Dana-Farber and the Broad Institute. Uh, this is from uh, the Larimer paper, where they imaged uh, Earlier on, they imaged at day 14 using anti-CD3 antibodies and divided the, the uh, mice into groups that either had high tumor uptake or low tumor uptake. And then by day 17, they could distinguish that the ones that had high tumor uptake showing CD8 infiltration were the ones that where the tumor growth was arrested and remained the same. So they could indeed earlier on predict which of the mice would progress and which ones wouldn't. Okay, how about this question? Can activation of T cells be imaged and is it predictive? So this is not truly an immunoped, except, well, the target's an immunological target, but again, this is from Umar Mahmoud's lab, where granzyme B uh, release by T cells, you know, that's actually one of the mechanisms by which they kill. So they developed a peptide analog that fits in the granzyme B active site, radio labeled it with copper 64, I think, because that's NODA, and looked at uh, treated mice uh, and uh, could see a difference between responding mice and non-responding mice based on the fact that they are now directly imaging the presence of the granzyme B uh, being released. And then, uh, finally, the real question, can we image immunotherapy biomarkers in patients? So this slide actually is courtesy of Elizabeth DeFries and her group in Groningen. They presented this at, in abstract form at AACR last year. And so what they've done is they have patients uh, that were uh, prior to treatment with a tezolizumab, which is an anti-PDL1 antibody, and they imaged him with zirconium-89 labeled drug as shown here. They initially did serial images to identify the optimal imaging time, which was day seven, and then they uh, continued the series by imaging you know, at one week and then biopsies uh, prior to starting treatment. And this is just one of those time courses showing you 
early on you see blood pool and here is the tumor and then over time you can see activity increasing in the tumor uh, and uh, in their subsequent work, you know, they will be reporting their results on how this correlates with biopsies in those patients as well as treatment response. And finally, can we directly image those cytotoxic T cells in patients? So we think the answer is yes. This is a um, mini body. It's the larger fragment humanized that recognizes human CD8 labeled with zirconium-89, and in a preclinical model of NSG mice that have been transplanted with human PBMCs, at one week you get engraftment of the human immune system. They're humanized mice. But if you wait four or five weeks, th that human immune system recognizes the mouse as foreign and tries to reject it, so you end up with graft-versus-host disease. And if you look at images, what you can see is that at one week, here is engraftment. You see very strong signal in the spleen. You also see liver signal, which in this case is a combination of both the clearance of the mini body to the spleen as well as there is hematopoiesis that takes place in, in the liver. And on the right, at four weeks, you can also see this haze developing in the lung. And that actually is one of the organs that is targeted by GVHD in these uh, models. And when we subsequently take the tumors, uh, the, take the normal, the tissues out and stain them for the human CD8 T cells, that is exactly what you see. Uh, here are those human CD8 T cells in the lung where they're not supposed to be. So finally, I'm delighted to be able to show you work that's been uh, come, uh, done in, in uh, collaboration with Memorial Sloan Kettering. And that is the uh, clinical images from the first in human study looking at CD8 imaging in, in patients uh, who are eligible for checkpoint inhibitor therapy. This is one patient, a female with metastatic melanoma who'd been on pembrolizumab for about two years. And uh, importantly, uh, after the imaging with CD8 immunopet, um, there were no adverse events or side effects. Uh, the study is now up to about uh, five or six patients that have been uh, injected and immunized. And first, if you look at the whole body scan, what you will see is rapid visualization of the normal lymphoid patients. So I think for the, one of the, for the first time we are looking at, here is the spleen, here is the bone marrow, here are the lymph nodes in uh, this patient. You'll notice that the liver uh, is very relatively cool. Those dots that you see over the liver are actually the tips of the ribs. And then even more exciting than seeing where we thought we should see T cells, which is in the, the spleen and, and lymph nodes and marrow, this is the FDG PET from the uh, patient showing a small lesion in the muscle in the shoulder region. And then if you look with CD8 immuno PET, you can see that same region is lighting up. So we believe that this is what we're looking at is the CD8 T cell infiltration in this patient that's on checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So uh, this uh, work will be presented in greater detail at ASCO and SNMMI uh, coming up a little later this year. So I'll wrap up. Uh, we have a non-invasive whole body approach for visualizing immune cells and immunological biomarkers. And I think I've given you an examples of how we can use this uh, to look at um, and, and potentially guide treatment ther uh, patient therapy um, and treatment monitoring by looking at those early on treatment responses, being able to distinguish true progression from pseudo progression, perhaps to be able to start to image and, and anticipate uh, and, and react to toxicities. Uh, and I think where it may be truly uh, useful is to, to guide the development of combination therapies. We do have some challenges, um, which I won't go through in great detail because I think I've gone a little bit over time, uh, and it's, it's lunchtime. But I'd like to thank um, the members of my lab who have contributed to uh, largely the preclinical work and my collaborators at UCLA who provided all these wonderful models and um, just really have educated us on these models. And then, of course, our collaborators at Memorial Sloan Kettering for the clinical studies and Imaginab for developing the uh, agent and our funding sources. So I'll stop there. Um, I think we're not doing questions. Uh, I will say uh, there are, I think there's slides, certainly, um, I think our, that does conclude uh, this uh, opening session. And it's now time for lunch, followed by posters uh, from 1 to 2 o'clock. So thank you for your attendance. Thank you.